Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> and happy spiritual Mother's Day. It's worth hearing twice. Whether you are a biological mom or not, and this is all of you young girls here, every Christian woman and girl is a spiritual guide and mentor and shepherd to others. And we guys and gals are indebted to all of you and thank you and thank the Lord for you and the blessing that you are in our lives. Now, before I begin, I want to congratulate two of our international postgrad students who just finished their doctorates at UL. On Thursday evening, Margaret and Oren and I went to see the hooding ceremony at UL, uh, actually at the Cajun Dome, for the now Dr. Rizik of uh, Lebanon, who is on the right, and uh, Dr. Aguda from the Philippines. These are very smart young men. Uh, you have to be a PhD to even understand Dr. Rizik's dissertation topic, and Dr. Aguda here in his lab has worked with NASA on how astronauts can grow food in space on the long flight that will go to Mars. And so these two young men are light years beyond me. Now, I want to ask you a serious question, and I don't want to see any show of hands, but how many of you have ever had the experience that you know what it's like to not be appreciated? How many of you know what it's like to not be valued for who you are and for what you do? Well, let me tell you a story about young Gracie. Young, younger daughter Gracie knew what it was like to not be appreciated. Gracie longed for her father's approval, but she never got it. Gracie's dad was a workaholic. He was a self-made millionaire, a former boxer, and the Olympic medalist in rowing. He adored his older daughter, Peggy, who was Gracie's older sister. Peggy was a tomboy. She excelled in any sport. She was self-confident. She had a great sense of humor, just like her dad. So dad and his older daughter, Peggy, were like two peas in a pod. Gracie idolized her older sister, Peggy, but they were nothing alike. Gracie was nearsighted, bespectled, a bookworm. She was shy and awkward, a failure in every sport she tried. Peggy took advantage of her younger sister by turning Gracie into an errand girl. So just imagine Dad's surprise when Gracie, like Cinderella, became a movie star. And even on the night that Gracie won an Oscar, her dad told the reporters, well, I always thought it would be Peggy. The world remembers Peggy's younger sister, Gracie, as a real-life princess whose foot fit the glass slipper. Who'd have thought that this family introvert who grew up in the shadow of her older sister, who the girl deprived of her father's approval, used the silver screen as a stepping stone to a throne. You've never heard of her favored, her dad's da favorite daughter, Peggy Kelly, but you have heard of the backward younger sister, Grace Kelly, who became her royal highness, the princess of Monaco. In our study today, in the great New Testament book of Romans, we're going to see how the Apostle Paul appreciated, cherished, and valued Christian women. Now sadly, Paul has gotten a bad rap over the years as a woman hater, but nothing could be further from the truth. For Paul honors ten women at the end of Romans in the first verses of Romans chapter 16. Before we do our study together, as I always try to do, let's talk to our Heavenly Father. Dear Father, we praise you. You are perfect as our Heavenly Dad. There's no one like you, Lord. We thank you for our biological mothers, even for those who didn't always treat us kindly, but who did choose life so that we could be born. We're also grateful for our spiritual moms, who encourage us by their tender care in the Lord. Bless all of our moms who are still living and help us honor them, whether they deserve that honor or not, for none of us deserves your grace and mercy. Teach us now your holy word by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' caring name, amen. 
Since this is Mother's Day, I'm not, I will not go on to the next section of Romans where I would have been, which is Romans chapter 1, verse 18, because that deals with a very important biblical topic that's not exactly appetizing on Mother's Day. Romans 1.18 talks about the wrath of God. So I'm not going to do that to you on Mother's Day. So instead, we're going to fast forward to the end of Romans and look at this passage in Romans 16, 1 to 15, that where Paul honors 10 women, and so let's, and at least one or more of them were moms. So follow with me. In Romans 16, at the end of his letter to the churches in Rome, Paul greets 26 Christians, 24 of them by name, men and women, two are unnamed, and nine of the 26 are women. Quite interesting. This was extraordinary because in the first century, women were not valued in either Jewish or Roman society. And when we add the lady that Paul commends in the first two verses of Romans 16, that all together Paul honors 10 women in this final chapter, and that's the subject of our um, sermon today. So in the introductory uh, sermon to this series, I talked about this lady named Phoebe. So let's read the first couple of verses, Romans 16. Paul writes, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant, we'll talk about that word, of the church in Sincrea. So you should welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her, help her, in whatever matter she may require your help. For indeed, she has been a benefactor, we'll talk about that word, of many and also of me. Paul tells us four key facts about Phoebe as you look at those couple of verses. Phoebe seems to be the person that Paul trusted to deliver this most important letter of all of his Romans. Then notice Paul commends Phoebe so that when she gets to Rome carrying the original manuscript of Romans, that the Roman Christians will trust her, they will welcome her, they will extend her hospitality, which meant that they would feed her, give her lodging, they would give her any help that she needed, and they would help her navigate that very vast and dangerous city of Rome. But notice in the first couple of lines of verse 1 that Paul introduces Phoebe as a servant of the church of Sincrea. That was a seaport a few miles from the city of Corinth where we believe Paul wrote this letter in Corinth. So let me turn on my uh, laser pointer here. And so, of course, this is Greece and... um, Adriatic Sea here, and Rome would have been over here, then the Aegean Sea. So in the south of Greece, we have the city of Corinth, and then Sincrea is a port. So let me go one slide further. So once again, Athens would be this way. Corinth was here, a very wicked city. This is where Paul would, what we think, wrote Romans. The Isthmus of Corinth, this small land bridge, and then Sincrea is the seaport. And today, this is all that's left of Sincrea, which is just ruins there on the seashore. But then going on to the text, look at this word servant. In Greek, that is the word diakonos, uh, which is translated deacon in most places. Uh, We get our English word deacon directly into English from that. But notice this word can be translated other ways, courier. Uh, agent, intermediary. And so Phoebe was either a deaconess of that church in Sincrea or she had some other important leadership role in the church. But finally, notice the second verse. Paul brags on Phoebe as a benefactor, next to the last line there in the blue letters. We can also translate that Greek word as patron. So apparently, Phoebe was a wealthy businesswoman. She supported Paul's ministry. She supported other, uh, apparently, Christian missionaries donated to the church. So this short paragraph here tells us why Paul trusted Phoebe so much to deliver the most important letter in human history. There could be no greater honor bestowed on any human being, much less on any woman, that Paul gave to Phoebe the responsibility to deliver the most important book ever written, which is the book of Romans. Now let's go to a second woman that Paul commends, Priscilla. Now let's read it. Give my greetings to Prisca. We often see her name as Priscilla, which is called by the big word a diminutive. That means a small version of the name, like our Priscilla. That was either a little girl, a child's name, or it was an endearing name. It's something that Joe might call 
uh, Priscilla uh, just one-on-one. -on -one. So Prisca is the formal name. Priscilla is the endearing or the child's name. So but look at what Paul says. Give my greetings to Prisca, Priscilla, and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ, Jesus, who risk their own necks for my life. Not only do I thank them, but so do all the Gentile churches. Greet also the church that meets in their home. Now, this power couple in the early church are mentioned six times in the New Testament. Two times Aquila's named first, and the other four times Priscilla is named first. And so I've given you the scriptures there. You can look up later. Why does Paul mention Priscilla first? Well, we don't know. Here's some suggestions. Perhaps she was better known, more educated, or had a higher social status than Aquila. But, you know, none of those things to me sound like what Paul's attitude would be. Then also possibly she may have been more spiritually mature than Aquila. Remember that she and Aquila discipled Apollos together, which was astonishing for a first century wife to do. Uh, so that's a possibility, but this is the third one I think is perhaps obvious. Paul's deep personal friendship and love for this couple gave him the liberty to mention her name first. You noticed earlier when I was talking about the graduation exercise, I said Margaret and Oren, or Janet and Bob, or you know any couple you could name the wife first. So I think this shows Paul's pure heart for women, so there may be no other explanation as to why Paul mentions her first, other than just you know, his love for these people. But Paul tells us four things about Priscilla and Aquila here. They were Paul's co-workers. They were also tent makers with Paul. And tent makers weren't just those who sewed the canvas for a tent. Tent makers also worked in leather goods, which could be saddles. They also worked in other forms of canvas, which would be like making the sails for sailing ships. Then notice that they, verse 4, they risked their lives for Paul. Perhaps that happened at that terrible riot that occurred in Ephesus, um, but they saved his life. And then notice Paul says that all the Gentile churches are grateful for this couple and for their ministry. What a tribute. And Paul gives it to both Priscilla and Aquila. And finally, notice there is a church, he says, that meets in their house in Rome. So what did that look like? Well, here we see a restoration of a Roman villa from the first century, and uh, it's, it's, it's been restored, and here's another one. But you can just see that how it would be very uh, conducive to a church service for all the Christians to meet there in the courtyard. They could sing, they could sit on the ground, uh, and they could listen to someone preach uh, in that kind of a setting. So that's the idea of, the, of a Roman house where they could have a church that met there. And of course, today in China and many countries of the world, there are still millions of house churches where Christians meet. Then a third woman that Paul pays tribute to, named Mary. He says, greet Mary who worked very hard for you. Well, I'm going to give you a pop quiz, and here's the question. Can you name the six or seven New Testament women who were named Mary? Okay, let's see if you, how many you could get. Oh, by the way, just as an aside, Moses' sister Miriam is a variation of the name Mary in Hebrew. So that's really what Moses' sister's name was. Miriam, same, same name as Mary in Hebrew. First of all, Jesus' mother Mary, obvious one, Mary Magdalene. Then third, the other Mary, who was the mother of Jesus' two disciples named James the Less and Joseph. Or Joseph. This other Mary was present at both Calvary and at the Garden Tomb. Then fourth, we have Mary, the wife of Clopas, who was also uh, at those same places, Calvary and the tomb. But possibly she's the same Mary as number three. So if she's the same Mary as this mother of James and Joseph, then there's only six Marys in the New Testament. But then going on, Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus of Bethany. Then Mary, the mother of John Mark, who owned a large home in our large house in Jerusalem, which was the scene of some very significant New Testament events. We believe the Last Supper occurred in the upper room of her house. We believe the miracle on the day of Pentecost occurred in the upper room of this lady's house. And uh, the great prayer meeting that delivered Peter from uh, prison also occurred at the upper room of this lady's house. So some significant events we think occurred there. And then finally, six or seven, this Mary who is in Rome. Let's look at her briefly. Uh, Paul sent 
sends her his greeting, and then he says, uh, well, just just one more point, Uh, the name Mary, since all the other ladies that we looked at, uh, they were Jewish ladies, then we think probably this Mary was also Jewish. So notice Paul says she worked very hard, but the Greek word to work hard is means to exert oneself, to strive, to struggle, to toil to the point of exhaustion. So notice how this Mary served above and beyond the call of duty for other believers there in Rome, and Paul singles her out and commends her for that. Then a fourth lady named Junia, and so Paul writes in verse 7, Greet Andronicus and Junia. Talk about the name. My fellow countrymen and fellow prisoners, they are noteworthy in the eyes of the apostles, and they were also in Christ before me. Now, this second name, Junia, could also be Junius. If it's Junius, then it's a man, which means that Andronicus and Junius would either be brothers or just friends. But the Greek favors that this is a feminine name, Junia. So this was, we think, is a lady. So Andronicus and Junia could be another husband and wife like Priscilla and Aquila, but notice he puts the husband first in this case. Paul tells us four things about Andronicus and Junia, assuming they're a couple. They were Paul's countrymen. Some translations have kinsmen. That doesn't mean they were from his immediate family, but I think it's another way of him saying they were Jews. Then at some point, this couple had been Paul's fellow prisoners for the sake of the gospel. We don't know when that occurred, but certainly what a, what a bond that would have created. Imagine to be in jail with somebody else who's a Christian because you're a Christian. Then notice they were respected by the apostles. Now that is an incredible statement for a first century woman. It's possible to understand this phrase, noteworthy or respected by the apostles, to mean that Andronicus and Junia themselves were apostles, not the 12 apostles Jesus called, but missionaries sent out like Paul was to preach the gospel. And then finally, uh, they became Christians before Paul was converted. So that means that Andronicus and Junia may have become Christians on the day of Pentecost, And they later went back and perhaps helped to start the church in Rome. But again, notice with these women, Priscilla Aquila here, Andronicus and Junia, that Paul puts the the husband and wife as equal partners in the ministry of the church. Then the next two ladies, Tryphena and Tryphosa, uh, um, beginning in, in verse 12. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa who have worked hard. See that word again, in the Lord. Now, we think that these two women were Romans and possibly sisters. Now, their similar sounding names could mean they were twin girls. Tryphena's name in Greek means dainty. Tryphosa's name in Greek means delicate. So, we, it's also possible that these two uh, women could have been slaves or slaves who had been freed. But notice Paul commends them for the same thing he commended Mary. They worked hard. They exerted themselves. They toiled to the point of exhaustion in the Lord. And, you know, it's possible as Paul dictated this because he didn't write it by hand. He dictated this letter to a male secretary to write. Perhaps Paul smiled as he said these two names because their rigorous service to the Lord doesn't match their names at all. So just imagine, you know, Paul's added, well, dainty and delicate sure do know how to work hard. <laughs> And so uh, if we, don't, we don't always live up to our names, or sometimes we live beyond our names. Then the next lady, Persis. He says, greet my dearly loved friend Persis, who has worked very hard, I'll learn that verb by now, in the Lord. The name Persis is a Persian name. So this lady could have been a Roman from Persia who immigrated to Uh, Rome, or she could have been a Jewish lady whose ancestors came from Persia after Israel's exile to the land of Persia. So she could have been Jewish or Roman. Either way, we think she has a Persian background. But regardless, she's the fourth woman that Paul names who has worked tirelessly in the Lord. So what a commendation for these ladies. And now one of my favorites, number eight, Rufus's mother. Paul writes, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, 
and mine. I once knew a dog named Rufus, but this is a man. And so the backstory of this verse may have been a drama for the ages, but to get a glimpse of what this story possibly involved, we need to go back to the end of the Gospel of Mark. So Mark 15, 21. Mark writes, they forced a man coming in from the country who was passing by to carry Jesus' cross. He was Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus. So the story here is very familiar to all of you who know the Gospels. Jesus tried to carry his cross to Calvary, but he was so weak from the scourgings and the other tortures he had endured that the Roman soldiers forced a Jewish man named Simon from Cyrene in North Africa to carry Jesus' cross the rest of the way. And by tradition, after this life-changing experience of meeting Jesus on the road to the crucifixion, the tradition is that Simon later became a Christian with his family. Now, in support of that is Mark 15, because Mark, we believe, wrote his gospel to Gentile Christians in Rome. Mark was with Paul in Rome shortly after he wrote Romans. And so Mark mentions this man named Rufus and Alexander who were well known to the Christians in Rome. You weave all that together, and so it's very possible that this Rufus is the son of Simon who carried Jesus' cross, and that the whole family had been converted through that experience of the dad. Well, that brings us then to Rufus's mother, Simon's wife, on this interpretation. Notice Paul doesn't give her name but he doesn't have to. Notice what depth of feeling pours from Paul's heart in just that one phrase, his mother and mine, his mother and my mother. Paul was the greatest Christian who ever lived, the greatest missionary who ever lived, and he loved this woman enough to call her his spiritual mom. That is praise that is greater than praise from Nero. Fellow believer, If you know a lady who has done for you what your own mother did, or perhaps even more, thank the Lord for her. If she's still alive, thank her face to face, or send her an old-fashioned card or, or letter. You know, you don't have to say the words, you've been like a mom to me, but you can let her know how much you treasure her ministry to you, her wise counsel, her listening ear, and above all, her prayers for you that have helped to make you the Christian that you are today. And all of you girls and ladies here, please listen to me. If no woman has ever done that for you, what Rufus's mom did for Paul... Perhaps your own mom hasn't even done that for you. Then you be that kind of woman. You become that kind of woman who becomes a female discipler and shepherd in the Lord's gentle hands to care for and nurture young men and women who need a chaste feminine touch in their lives. You know, there are so many ministry opportunities all around us every day. May God open our eyes, both men and women, both teenagers, young people, to see how God can use us as his instruments in his mighty hands to touch a broken and hurting world. And finally, the last two ladies in the list, Julia and Nerus's sister. Paul writes in verse 15, Greet Philologus and Julia, Nerus and his sister, and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. So in verse 15, this may be yet another Christian couple, Philologus and Julia. If they were married, then perhaps Nerus and his sister were their children. And once again, notice all the saints are with them. That indicates another one of the house churches that was meeting in Rome. Now, Julia is a Latin name, so we think that probably her family here were Romans, Gentiles. If this is correct, then Julia and Nerus's sister would be the only mother and daughter in this list. Philologos in Greek means lover of the word. What a great name, a lover of the word which indicates this man may have been highly educated. If so, then his wife and children may have also been cultured, educated Romans. Some interpreters think that they were upper-class citizens in Rome, possibly, and some of the people in chapter 16 may have even been as high as connected to the royal palace, but we're not sure. 
Okay, let's sum things up. If you look back at this list of 10 women, we can make a couple of observations about the churches in Rome and certainly other churches in the first century. Women had an active, vital role in the life and ministry of the church. Phoebe may have been a deaconess. Junia may have been a commended missionary. Mary, Tryphena, Tryphosa, and Persis were all hard workers in the church. And Rufus's mother cared for Paul like his own mother. And if we include the names of the men in this list, and we'll study those names of the men later in our normal pattern in the series on Romans, we're going to see that the Roman church included Jews and Gentiles, Men and women, couples and certainly singles, slaves and free, educated and non-educated, cultured and non-cultured. In our day, with so much talk about acceptance and inclusion, we see that the Roman church was a shining example of how Jesus, through his blood, has brought together a diverse group of saved sinners from all backgrounds and walks of life into one local and one universal body of Christ. Now, Paul isn't the only one who's gotten a bad rap over the years. Long before Cinderella, stepmothers were infamous. And I'm not talking uh, that it's not necessarily that uh, some of the stepmoms fit that bill of the wicked stepmother. But that's not always the case. There are very good stepmoms. And let me give you an example. In the early 1800s, a Christian girl named Sarah married a man named Daniel. They had three children, and their marriage wasn't easy. Daniel incurred debts, and at one point, the only job that Daniel could find was the county jailer. So Sarah and the three children were forced to live in the jailhouse. She became the cook and the cleaner in the jail. Then Daniel died of cholera. Later, widow Sarah met a widower named Thomas with two children from his first marriage. He proposed to her, and his proposal, which I'll tell you if you're interested after the sermon, was very cute. They got married, and so Sarah took her three kids, and Thomas took his two kids, and they lived together as a blended family on a farm in Indiana in a log cabin. Sarah treated Thomas's two children like her own children. Thomas's boy was only 10 when they married, and her love helped him overcome the grief at the death of his mother. In time, Thomas's boy learned to call her mama. Sarah encouraged this boy's appetite for reading and learning. She let him read her books, which included the Bible, Aesop's Fables, and Pilgrim's Progress. She encouraged him all through his years of school and later when he went to law school. His stepmother, Sarah, was good and kind to him. And she treated him like her own son. They had a good relationship all of his life. And Sarah was not surprised when she heard that he had been shot and killed. For his dad, Sarah's second husband, was Thomas Lincoln. And his son, Sarah's stepson, was Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States. There's a reason why Sarah was, Lincoln was a good stepmom, and there's a good explanation why the ten women Paul praised were outstanding Christians. These faithful women were daughters of our Heavenly Father, who was conforming them to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. For us Christians, our Heavenly Father is always good and kind to us, save sinners, who now are His adopted children in Christ. And because of the great truth we're learning in this book of Romans, that God declares us righteous and gives us his righteousness in Christ, our Father in heaven always treats us like he treats his only begotten son. Dear Father, help us not just to be like the women that we study today. Help us to be like you. You are the best parent. Help us to be like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that although we don't deserve it, you always treat us like you treat your son, Jesus. We ask this in his blessed name. Amen. Have a wonderful Mother's Day and week.